I'm going to step back now from what Paolo is doing and look at a more macro perspective, including three separate microgroups in the Czech Republic. I have to admit that this work is somewhat preliminary. We only finished collecting data in the summer and we haven't had time to go through all of it. So basically what we're looking at here today is some key points that we found, which were surprising for us as researchers. I myself am working in the Depart Department of Political Science at Charles University, and my colleague Zivka Delava was previously working in the Department of Sociology in Comenius University in Bratislava, but now she's on maternity, so I'm basically by myself. Uh, <clears throat> I hope to cover all of this today. Unfortunately, I'll have to move quite quickly, I feel, due to the time constraints. Uh, basically, we're looking at the fact that there are several large groups of migrants in the Czech Republic that are understudied. Ukrainians account for about 148,000 individuals, legitimately <clears throat> registered, you could say. Uh, about 50,000 Vietnamese who are legitimately registered with the government, as well as large groups of other groups, other linguistic groups. For example, there's about 84,000 Slovaks who are Slovak citizens registered and working in the Czech Republic. And these groups have not been studied adequately within the Czech Republic, and therefore we sought to find not an adequate uh, qualitative study, but a purpose of sample to further research or to look at in the future more deeply, I suppose. Uh, unfortunately, our sample was not <clears throat> adequate, you could say, because it was a self-selected sample of those who were voluntary or willing to participate in our sample. And it was a snowball sample which led to a kind of cascade effect, leading to a sample which is purposive, but not specific, probably. The first round of the survey was uh, kind of a test phase with just Slovak respondents. And it led to a sample of about 222 individuals. About 75 or 78 percent were highly educated, which was our intended target group. And I present today only the information that covers those that are highly educated, having a BA, MA, or PhD level education. This is to be very, or to try to be as specific as possible when looking at our information. Uh, the second sample was a broadcast of more languages. We prepared the sample in Russian. The same survey was also in Ukrainian and in English. Uh, unfortunately, we're not able to translate into Vietnamese, even though it's a very important uh, ethnic community within Czech Republic, but we didn't have the resources available to us or a translator who would be willing to do the work for us uh, because we have no funding, so it was voluntary based always. Uh, our secondary group was a bit smaller than the first, and as you'll see, it's not an ideal sample, but we feel that it's enough to begin with for now. Basically, the first round was only Slovaks coming from across the Slovak state, basically. None were from only the east, and none were from only the West. What we found is that unexpectedly, you could say, very few of our respondents came from specific regions which are underdeveloped or poorly developed. What we found instead is we had a very wide sampling of age groups, uh, terms in the Czech Republic, as well as region of origin, which was somewhat surprising because we had anticipated that we'd have more Eastern Slovaks because of the depressed economic situation in that region. Uh, luckily for us, we had a very wide distribution which kind of validated our uh, feelings, you could say. <clears throat> in the second round, we had Russians coming from across the Russian Federation, as well as several Ukrainians. However, surprisingly, only four people completed our survey in Ukrainian. About 45 Ukrainians completed the survey in Russian, which made it very hard to segregate them later on for our data. And therefore, today what I present is the Russian English group as one, and the Slovak group separately, because it's the only way we could really work with the data. Uh, we've had English-speaking individuals from all of European, well, I think 15 European countries, as well as North America and as far afield as Australia. Uh, unfortunately, this is a very small sample again. You'll see the numbers in a moment when I show you the graphs. It's 45 respondents, 55 respondents who fit the criteria, basically. One of the limitations that we found is basically that we were hoping to find people from across the Czech Republic, but given that the e economic development and the opportunities available are limited to the larger cities, we found that most foreigners are focused on the Prague region. And in fact, Prague has about 14% of its population being made up of foreigners. Well, according to the Czech Statistical Office, it's anybody from outside the Czech Republic, basically. Uh, and the majority of them are relatively recent arrivals. We had a few people that came from other regions of the Czech Republic, but less than 5% of our sample is living outside of the core capital, which was somewhat problematic as well, but it's a different issue, basically. Um, we find that work is one of the primary reasons or rationales for migrant for most migrants coming to the Czech Republic. However, uh, we decided to term many people lifestyle migrants. I noticed earlier that people use this term in a very different way than what we applied it, uh, basically. But essentially, we're looking at individuals who chose to come for work and then chose to stay, or those who came as students and chose to stay. And we deemed those individuals basically lifestyle migrants because it's nearly a quarter of our sample 
Are those students who decided to come back after doing an Erasmus exchange in Prague, or those who decided to stay on after coming for a short period of time as a visitor, for example? Um, one of the outcomes of this survey was basically that networks are very important, but only for some people. And I'll explain that later on, basically, <clears throat> if we can skip through quickly. Basically, we found that each group had varying rationales for the reason to come to the Czech Republic in the first place, and therefore, different life histories, basically. And as I mentioned earlier today, it's not possible to have a practice story because we have too many stories, basically. And therefore, we try to aggregate the data to make it, I don't know, quantifiable in easy chunks, basically, which is not so easy. As you see here, about a quarter of people came for work. A quarter came for personal reasons, and with the Russians particularly, they came for reasons of family reunification, something that wasn't seen within other groups at all. And this is partially because of the visa regime and partially because of the limitations on uh, movement that are in, kind of instilled now within the EU. What was even more interesting for us is what people were doing before they migrated and what they did after migration. And the reason that I'm presenting this data here is because later on I'm going to show you several graphs which divide people according to what they did before and what they did after. And essentially we were forced to distinguish between students and non-students, locals and foreigners, local education and foreign education in the data. But interestingly enough, we found that employment generally is very high for all groups under study, but particularly so amongst Slovaks. And we find this is probably because, or we predict it's because, most of them were students who then moved in search of work. Because the limited opportunities in Eastern Slovakia, Central Slovakia, limit the options for professional development for many, especially at a young age. This is a trend that we've seen through time, and other authors have discussed it as well, and specifically in the paper you'll find Malisha Williams is the only other study discussing Slovak educated students. Uh, so there's very few options for us in terms of background material to use. On the other hand, we find that many individuals who come from Russia, for example, are now self-employed. And earlier somebody mentioned that all the self-employed are construction workers, or many are. In this case, it's not true. We find that the Russians, for example, are self-employed for visa reasons, and secondarily because they make very good money in the Czech Republic. Uh, they're able to basically be four times higher than the average national wage, simply because they're doing different kinds of business, and it's not only construction. So we, we did find that the kind of normal explanation of the Ukrainians are coming to Prague to work in construction is not always true. We find that these highly educated especially tend to be in higher level professions or be self-employed in the higher level trades basically, or they're managing other businesses as well. Uh, we had two, for example, that make upwards of 5,000 euro per month as their base wage, and those are basically three fellows that own two companies that are trading within the Czech Republic and within the European Union. So they don't kind of fulfill the criteria of immigrant worker basically that we had anticipated we would find. And de-skilling was not an issue for our groups basically. Uh, now, jumping back to the female-male gendered gap, we find that typically the wage salary levels that people have fit very closely to the Czech national average, which is that there's 16% difference between males and females, up to 40% gap between those working in the financial services and banking sector. And all of our groups fit this criteria very closely. Specifically, women make much less money than men. However, I'll go to the next slide, I'll show you satisfaction. Women make much less money, especially the Russian and Ukrainian speaking women, make much less money than their male counterparts. However, they're far more satisfied. And this messy graph shows this, that the green arrow points to the satisfaction level being very high. And we found that 80% of women are happy. They're happy with the decision to move, they're satisfied with their decision, they're satisfied with what they're doing now, and they're happy to be in low paid jobs, even if it's for 15 years. And in the paper I describe how there's no real uh, statistical clarification or point that shows that it's an issue of time in the Czech Republic. Those who came five years ago, those who came 15 years ago, are very happy to stay in the job that they have now. Although those who make more money, the men on the right side, are very dissatisfied with the decision because they're framing their reference point differently. Uh, this is something that was discussed later, or should be discussed later, perhaps we'll have time, that men tend to make more money, however, are less satisfied because they're framing it in reference to their hometown. And they're saying, for example, that Okay, I'm making very good money here, but I could make more if I go home, but my family wants me to stay here. Whereas women are saying, this is a good opportunity, I don't want to go home. I like living in the Czech Republic, I don't want to go back to Russia, for example, for political reasons. Which is very interesting for us, because each group was very specific in that. And coming to my next graph here, you find that each group had very different rationales and different ways of finding employment. We find that Slovaks, for example, are highly dependent on the internet and direct contact with employers 
Whereas Russian-speaking males, for example, are highly dependent on close friends. And this is a problem we had with, or it's a limitation with the linguistic structure of our survey. Basically, close friends for Russians meant family and best friends. Whereas if we asked about acquaintances, the Russians said they didn't have any acquaintances that got them jobs. But the English speakers never said that their friends or family gave them employment. Always it was acquaintances and always higher level business contacts. And so we see within the different groups, there's very wide differentiation and segregation basically in how they found work and the employability prospects for the future and their wage basically as well. I don't have a good graph that shows it, but basically those who depended on acquaintances earned about a quarter more than those who depended on other means of employment, which was quite interesting for us as a preliminary survey anyways. In terms of the future aspirations or potential for return, we found that some groups are more willing or indicate that they will be willing to return home. For example, Slovaks would be willing to return home even given the unemployment levels in their home country if the conditions were right. Russians, no. Basically 82% said there's no chance they would go home until there's a political change in Russia. Which leads us to assume, I think quite clearly, that politics plays a very large role in the return aspirations of individuals. Um, we also asked individuals where they would go if they were to migrate to another EU state. And interestingly enough, many people said weather was a key issue, going to the south, for example, or quality of life in Spain, for example. But more interestingly, we found that Slovaks thought that there was no need really to migrate abroad, but if they were to migrate abroad for a short period of time, they would return to the Czech Republic and it would only help them in the future. Basically, the, the Slovaks were saying that moving to England for two years would enhance their possibility for growth in the future in the Czech Republic, not at home in the Slovak Republic. Basically, I've mentioned this already, so I'll skip ahead quite quickly. Uh, there was an apparent disconnect, though, between their willingness to de-skill in the future and their current employment. And this is part of the larger survey where I asked individuals, would you be willing to take a job outside of your professional area if you moved to the West? And the West was dependent on the group, of course, right? So it's not perfect, I could say. Uh, and what we found is Slovaks are not willing to de-skill. Russians are not willing to de-skill. However, 50% would be willing if they moved to de-skill. And this is something we found as a kind of psychological issue. With the Slovaks, specifically, a doctor working in a pharmaceutical in industry is not de-skilling, right? They're changing professions, they're jumping. And this is something we found with many groups, that they wouldn't de-skill and go into construction, for example, but they would hop between administrative jobs or higher level educate or higher level <coughs> businesses, basically. We would expect them all to fit the line quite nicely. If you're a doctor, you become a doctor, you fit on the line. If you're a teacher, you, you're a teacher, you fit on the line, right? And for the most part, Slovaks fit this criteria. However, Russians do not. Even though they're not willing to de-skill, they don't fit what we anticipated would be the straight line. And I'll come back to this in a minute as to why. English speakers fit better. There's a few that are jumping from profession to profession. Yes, it's true, but not all of them. Uh, and this is unexpected because we found that Slovaks, for example, don't see the Czech Republic as migration. It's going to Prague, quote unquote, or it's just going to the capital because historically they still have this connection with the state, right? And something that other groups do not have. We do find, however, that employment is very closely directed or directly rela related to your education level and where you have your degree from. In this case, those who come from non-EU states and have a degree from the non-EU state very closely match our expectations, except for a very small cluster who are still studying or teaching in education, and they come from other professions as well here. <clears throat> in contrast, one of the very surprising findings which we're still analyzing basically is this, that if you're from an EU state or you have a degree from within the EU, you take any job you can find or you're willing to jump. We can't determine which is which just yet. But earlier would have noticed that the Russians fit this kind of standard, whether it's not expected. And this is something that we need to look at more in the future. And when we actually get through the qualitative data as well, we'll be able to expand on more thoroughly. Uh, I'm sorry for the rapid progression, but I wanted to cover as much as possible today. If you have any questions, please ask me. I also have some more slides available uh, in the USB stick that provide more data if you need it for later on. Thank you. <coughs>